Good morning. morning. It's great to see everybody here, and if you're with us today in body and spirit in the church here, we're glad to see you. If you're listening to us on the radio, we're happy to have you with us. If you're seeing us on the internet, we are happy to have you with us. If you're visiting for the first time, a special welcome to you. And if you do not have a church home, uh, we would love to have you consider Clemens Moravian as your church home. Again, with our welcomes, we, uh, Pastor Chris had a commitment today. He is not with us, but uh, Pastor uh, Carter is here with us from the prison ministry. And he's been with us before, and we're delighted to have him with us. So thank you for being here. Uh, we had one uh, larger announcement in the bulletin, if you'd uh, make note of that, for our day of prayer s- services that will be ongoing for uh, through March. You might take a look at that and see which services that uh, you would like to participate in. Would you join me in a word of prayer now? Our Heavenly Father, We gather today in your house, a house of worship, but this is not just a house, it is a home that we as Christians occupy, and you as our Father dwell within also. We pray that you will always be with us, not only in this home, but also in each of our homes, and with us every minute of our lives. All these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand now, if you are able, and turn to page 37 for our Liturgy of Discipleship. What shall we render to the Lord for all his bounty to us? We will offer to the Lord the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Gracious God, for revealing yourself to us as one who created all things, who gave us dominion over all the earth, who called us into a covenant relationship with you, who has given us the privilege of being your ambassadors in our world, who loves us as your children through Jesus Christ our Lord. We give you our heartfelt thanks. seated. Jesus Christ, our Savior, because you were willing to come to earth in the likeness of humanity to take the form of a servant, because you became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, because God has highly exalted you and bestowed on you the name which is above every name, and at your name Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, 
and every tongue confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. We humbly bow before you in praise and adoration. Spirit, for dwelling within us and calling us to God by the gospel, for preserving us in the true faith, for leading the church on earth in its mission, for pointing the way of discipleship to each of us. We acknowledge your presence and power among us. Jesus said, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there should my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Hear your call to discipleship. Master, teach us the way we should go. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear much fruit and that your fruit should abide. Now the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness gentleness, self-control. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. We confess, Lord, that as your disciples, 
We have offered dishonored the holy name we bear. We ask your forgiveness for the times when we have failed to labor for your kingdom, when we have not followed your admission to seek first the kingdom of God, when we have hidden our light from the world, when we, as the salt of the earth, have lost our strength. Have mercy on us and restore unto us the joy of faithful discipleship. Amen. The Lord, your Redeemer, has said, with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you. Therefore, serve the Lord with gladness, witness to his goodness and mercy, and preach Jesus Christ as Lord with yourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. be seated. And now we have the opportunity and the privilege to bring to our Lord his tithe and our offering.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come today with joy and love in our hearts to your house. Our gifts represent that joy and love, knowing that the gifts we bring will be used to further your kingdom here on earth. Bless us, keep us, so that we may always do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If we have any children now that would like to attend Children's Church, we have someone that will greet you at the back of the church, and please exit in that direction now. Thank you. We'll now have our scripture readings. The first is from 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verses 18 through 31, and that's found on page 1038 in your pew Bible. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of the proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews ask for signs, and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Jesus crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Things that are not to abolish things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. In contrast, God is why you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us from God, the righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Our next next reading is from Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 through 2 or 1 through 12 pardon me and if you are able please stand with me When Jesus saw the crowds he went up the mountain and after he sat down his disciples came to him and he began to speak and taught them saying Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you 
and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And if you will remain standing now as we turn to page 584 in our hymn book for our next song. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you this morning. Blessings to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I want to thank Charles for meeting me this morning. And, uh, you know, as we're coming in, he said, well, we have some water for you. And we stepped up the stairs here to the pulpit and uh, stood up here there. And uh, I realized that uh, this is Bishop Wright's pulpit. And this is the Bishop's pulpit. And I stood up there. I uh, looked down and said, man, this is intimidating. I said, I thought, I thought, I'd feel like Moses coming down the mountain with the Ten Commandments standing up there. And uh, so, you know, I'm uh, Jeff Carter. I'm a chaplain for Scythe Jail and Prison Ministries. Uh, I'm your Moravian chaplain. And uh, so, you know, I feel comfortable down here because uh, actually this morning I was at the prison. We, I facilitated a, uh, a service. It's uh, called Donuts and Devotions with another church group that came down. So I'm, I'm comfortable uh, being with folks down on the ground. In fact, uh, real comfortable here because all the men who are there, they wear green clothes. And actually, it's about the color of your carpet. And so if I'm down here near your carpet, I feel real comfortable with that, all right? Uh, so uh, once again, blessings to each and every one of you. It's good, it's good to see Lisa here. She's uh, one of our committee members, a big, 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 uh, help in our committee and really appreciate Lisa and, and uh, her work and her passion for the work of the jail and prison ministry. Actually, she was coming up here to say hello to me. She goes, oh, you're moving uh, church furniture around this morning, I see. And so, well, you know, by that time, uh, I got a call from the jail. So I'm on call. So it's, it's been a busy morning so far. Yeah, but I'm so glad to be with you this morning and share God's word. Uh, I was told this morning we have a hard stop at 10.30, and, uh, and, that, and so uh, I'll try to make uh, as quick as I can. i got a lot to cover with you this morning. Uh, so will you uh, join with me just in a word of prayer? Father in heaven, do thank you and praise you for this time to be with these dear ones at Clemens Moravian. And uh, we just pray your blessings on Brother Chris as he's away today. Uh, help me to be faithful to you and to your word. And imparting your word to these dear ones, give us ears to hear and eyes to see what you'd have to speak to us this morning, O Lord our God. First in Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Amen. 
Well, if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Matthew chapter 5. You heard the gospel story. And once again, it's Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And you know, all throughout humanity, people have been in search for happiness. Happiness. Y'all remember that little song back in the 80s by Bobby McFerrin? Don't worry, be happy. Remember that song? Yeah? The words goes a little bit like this. Uh, Ain't got no place to lay your head. Nobody came and somebody came and took your bed. Don't worry, be happy. The landlord say your rent is late. He may have to litigate, but don't worry, be happy. You know? And and everybody loved that song, right? It just kind of made you happy. You know? He was going to litigate and Take your place away, but don't worry, be happy. You know, and everywhere you go, particularly now, the blogs and people on social media and on TV uh, always try to give us words of encouragement, uh, words of wisdom of how to be happy, words like treat yourself with kindness. Uh, Even if happiness forgets you a little bit, never completely forget about it. Self-esteem means knowing you are the dream. You know, so there's people, we always get these messages of how to be happy in the world. How to have happiness in our lives. And oftentimes throughout the history of humanity, the search for happiness, some try to find it in power, in money, in relationships, or I'm going to travel the world. Or at the end of a bottle. Or at the end of a pipe. Happiness, but for some reason, it escapes so many of us. And I believe that the God, the creator of heaven and earth and everything that is in the earth, I think he might know a little bit about happiness, don't you? In fact, he tells us how to be happy. Did you know that? Jesus is about to preach the greatest sermon the world has ever heard. We call it the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Let me read it again. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Greatest sermon ever preached. First of all, I'd like to bring your attention to something that we miss. Every time we read this passage, we kind of overlook this one part. In part of the Bible, it says that in verse 2, then he opened his mouth. Then he opened his mouth. Jesus went up on the top of the mountain. Disciples came to him. There was a multitude, and the Bible says, then he opened his mouth. Why is that significant? First of all, Jesus is is saying that Jesus is getting ready to say something very serious and very, very important. But also, I believe it says this. Remember back in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights, being tempted by the devil. And we read in the gospel, the first temptation that the devil came to Jesus with was what? If since you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And what was Jesus' response? It was right from the scriptures, right? 
It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds, what? From the mouth of God. I believe what Matthew is saying here by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus went up to the mountain, that he began to open his mouth, he opened his mouth, that God in the flesh is beginning to speak to you. That this is not just a prophet or a great teacher. This was God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, speaking from the mountain. Much like in the Old Testament, the Bible says that God spoke to the children of Israel from Mount Sinai. So we see Jesus is speaking to the people. God in the flesh is there among them. And the first word that he says is blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now that word blessed, we use that a lot. So, you know, I'm so blessed. You know, I bless you in Jesus' name. Lord, bless my family, bless my children. Lord, bless my church. But that word blessed really means happiness. Did you know that? It's a sense of obtaining God's favor. Happy is the emotion of receiving God's favor. It's being in a position of getting God's favor. And when we receive God's favor, there's joy, there's happiness. And so Jesus is saying, happy are you who are poor in spirit. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed, happy are you. The world is searching for happiness, but God gives us what happiness truly is. And when he says poor in spirit, this is a person of spiritual poverty. When I was growing up, one of my Bible teachers, she always say, uh, you know, Christians, so many Christians live in spiritual poverty. Live in spiritual poverty. They live below God's best for them because they refuse to live according to what he says in his word and live according to what they believe is going to make them happy. Poor in spirit. This is a person who realizes that they are spiritually destitute without God. This person acknowledges his or her need for Christ Jesus in their lives. To be poor in spirit. It's a result and result of realizing that we're poor in spirit. We're in need of Christ. Jesus said that yours is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit inherit eternal life by casting off all self-dependence, all self-reliance, all self-independence, realizing our need for God's salvation through Jesus Christ by grace through faith in him. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are you if you're poor in spirit. You realize your spiritual need your spiritual poverty apart from God and Christ Jesus. And he says, blessed or happy are you who mourn. Well, that doesn't make sense, Jesus. Why am I happy and blessed? Because I mourn, because I lament, because I cry, because my heart's broken. And that word mourn is a very powerful word. It, 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 it has the idea to grieve with such grief that it takes hold of your entire being. It's the sinner who laments his or her sin in the face of a holy God to where it takes hold of their entire being, their emotions, their soul, their entire mind. It reminds me of the story. You remember the story? Jesus was giving a story of there was a Pharisee. He came into the temple, and there was a tax collector. And the tax collector was on his knees, and he was beating his chest. He was asking God to forgive him. He wouldn't know so much as even look up from the ground because he was lamenting his sin before a holy God. And the Pharisee's like, thank you, God, I'm not like this guy. And Jesus said, which one of those two went away justified? The tax collector. Because he was lamenting his sin before a holy God. And asking God, forgive me. Forgive me for the day. Forgive me the things that I've done. Forgive me for the things that I said. Forgive me for living a self-independent life from you and doing my own thing, oh God. 
He wasn't worried about following the rules. He was worried about having a right relationship with the holy God of Israel. To lament, to mourn. Happy, blessed are you who mourn. And it really means agreeing with the Lord that, Lord, I got a problem. And I need your mercy and forgiveness in my life. Please forgive me. Just the other week, I was sitting in a chaplain's office at the prison. One of the guys that I see quite a bit, he came in and said, Chaplain, can I talk to you? I said, sure. So as we always do, he comes in and shut the door and sits down. He said, Chaplain, I just signed off on my release. I said, well, great. That's fantastic. And then he began to cry. And tears began to stream down his, his cheek. And they were not tears of joy, but tears of sorrow. You would think to be tears of joy because he knew he's going to be released soon. He signed off on that. But unfortunately, there were tears of sorrow. He said, you know what? He said, I read all the do's and don'ts and the rules and regulations of what I can and cannot do when I get out. Because of what I did before. And I'm so sorry that what I did hurt so many people. And I asked God to forgive me. And tears began to stream down his, down his cheeks. And you don't see that much in the prison. You don't hear a lot of guys lament and mourn their sin for how it hurt other people. But this one did. And I prayed with him. We talked a little bit. He, says, he said, you know, I've, I've got a young teenage son, and I don't know if I'll be able to see him. I've hurt so many people. And it broke my heart. But you know what? I believe that he went away out of that office justified before a holy God. But God says that he takes every tear of ours and he puts them in a bottle. And he captures them. And he doesn't forget one tear that we shed as we mourn and lament the things that we've done that have hurt other people, that have broken other people, but most of all, that have hurt God's heart and grieve his Holy Spirit. So Jesus said, Blessed are you who mourn, for you shall be comforted. We mourn our sin. We lament the things we've done. And God says, you will be comforted. I will come and comfort you by the presence of my Holy Spirit. And there's a future promise as well that when we leave this earth, and as the, as the scripture says, to, to leave the bodies to be present with the Lord and we see him face to face, there's going to be comfort like you can't imagine of seeing him face to face and just looking in his eyes and seeing pure love and pure comfort forevermore. Blessed are you who mourn. And he says also, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That means, to meek means to be gentle. It's a characteristic of a person who's totally devoid of malice and, and a desire for revenge. It's a person who's humble in spirit and gentle in spirit. Somebody who's patient when they're offended. It's meekness under control. It's strength under control. It reminds me of a great strong stallion. And a trainer has that stallion and they're training that stallion. And they keep that stallion under control as they're training it knowing that stallion is 100 times stronger than the trainer. But that stallion has such strength and agility and speed, but yet it's under control. That's meekness, strength under control. This person is, is a meek person who knows who God is and knows who they are. They willingly, humbly submit to God 
in their everyday life. You know, in this world, it's the meek who get eaten up. It's the humble who get run over and thrown under the bus. It's the weak who get, who get trampled on in this world. I mean, it, I mean, if you're not a wolf, then you're a sheep in this world. And sheep get eaten up. Jesus said, blessed are you, the meek in this world. Why? He says, because you shall inherit the earth. Once again, it's a future promise. Somewhere in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, gives us a promise that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, brothers and sisters. Which there's not going to be any more sin, no more death, no more war, no more crying. No more pain. But that the righteous will inherit this earth. Where the Lord Jesus Christ rules and reigns forever and ever. It's in the book. Read it. And so there's a progression from, from being poor in spirit. And in yours is the kingdom of heaven. Of mourning our sin. Of understanding of being meek, humble. Gentle, submitting to God and receiving the inheritance of the earth to hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You know, there's a longing for, that, to life, for life just to be right. That, that the world would be right. All of us have heard the news of what happened with the five police officers and, and the poor fellow who died. And people everywhere up in arms and because they, they know that's not right and the world needs to be put right. But it also means that there's a longing for our own personal lives to live in alignment with God's will and purpose for our lives. And lastly, on account of Jesus' righteousness, the Holy Son of God, the Bible says we too become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus in order to gain eternal life. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we may become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You know, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 64 verse 6, but we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousness is like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Apart from God, all the good things that we do, God says it's nothing but filthy rags to me. Because you're living in independence of me. In a relationship with me. Jesus said, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And the Pharisees got it right. They dotted the I's and they crossed the T's, man. I mean, nobody had it better than they did. And he said, unless your righteousness exceeds those guys, you ain't got a chance. So what's the answer? Jesus, what is the answer? A person who comes to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for their eternal life and being put right with God the Father by the shed blood of Jesus and faith in His work on the cross on our behalf, we're made right before God. And so the end result is that our souls will be filled, much like eating at a banquet and leaving completely full and satisfied. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. As we experience God's grace for our lives, we experience his mercy. At the same time, we're to be merciful. Blessed, happy are you. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. To be merciful carries with it the idea of compassion, to be sympathetic to someone's needs. 
It moves from a thought and a feeling to action. It's an action word. It's not getting what we deserve. Grace is receiving what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. As we've obtained mercy from God and receiving the Lord Jesus Christ and having eternal life through Him, God says in turn, you give mercy. Too much is given, much is expected. It's a reciprocal element to it. Much like the story Jesus told of the servant who, who could not pay his master $30 trillion. You remember the story? And he begged his master, said, Master, please have mercy, please have mercy. And he says, okay, I forgive you your debt. Don't worry about it. I know you can't pay it back. And then that same servant went to another servant, grabbed him by the throat and said, pay me your $50, the $50 you owe me, buddy. And the master found out, had that servant brought to him, said, listen, I, pay, I, I, I forgave you all that debt, and you go out here and you don't forgive somebody 50 bucks? Throw him in jail with the tormentors. Get him out of my sight. If you give mercy, you'll receive mercy in life from people, and most importantly, from God himself. We've obtained mercy in trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But you know, in this life, we continue to receive his mercy on a daily basis. Blessings and mercy and grace. And in turn, we're to give mercy because we receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What does it mean to be pure in heart? It means to have a heart that's unblemished, clean, undefiled. Sin pollutes and defiles the blood of Jesus Christ, washes the stains away and creates a new heart. Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. The heart is the center of our life. As it says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. That's in Proverbs chapter 4. Even Jesus said that all kinds of evil proceed out of the heart. It's a heart issue. A lot of the problems that we have in our personal problems, in our personal relationships and culture and society and the world, it's a heart issue. David said this, he said, create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right and steadfast spirit within me. He wrote that about a year after he committed adultery with Bathsheba. He was mourning, lamenting, and sin before God. He said, Lord, create in me a clean heart because it's dirty, it's stained, it's filthy. And only you can clean it and cleanse it. I can't do it any more than a leper can change its spots. Have mercy, O oh God. How often do you ask God to clean your heart, to give you a clean heart, a pure heart, a heart that's undefiled, and to wash you and to cleanse you of every sin, every pollution, every bitterness, every anger, frustration that you might have. And God says, as a result, they shall see God. Once again, it's future. It's looking to the future when we see him face to face. If you're pure in heart, the blood of Christ has washed us and cleansed our hearts and gives us a new heart that one day we will see him face to face as he is. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called children of God. The Bible says that we have been given this ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and given us ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. To be a peacemaker means that you are a reconciliation person. 
But before we can be peacemakers, we've got to have peace in our hearts. The world longs for peace. But once again, it's a hard issue. Jesus knew that, and God knows that. So when we come to faith in Jesus Christ and receive eternal life and receive His Holy Spirit, He gives us a new nature. And having a new heart by the Holy Spirit, God imparts that new nature within us and peace rules in our hearts because the Prince of Peace lives here. And as a result, we're to go about being peacemakers, bringing reconciliation where there's brokenness and there's division in our personal relationships, in our homes, in our churches, in our society, in our community. God calls us to be reconcilers because God reconciled us to him through his son, Jesus Christ. God says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So God calls us to be peacemakers, and therefore we'll be called children of God. Isn't that wonderful? Number 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, wait a minute. Happy am I when I'm persecuted? I have God's favor when I'm persecuted? Wait a minute now, Jesus. All this stuff's okay. Now, this persecution stuff, man, that, that, that's, that's getting a little, little hairy now. What do you mean to be happy? For righteousness' sake. The idea is that as Jesus' followers, the world will see our values, our characters, our beliefs that do not align with culture and society and the prevailing attitude of the world. And therefore, persecution comes. Did you know that Christians are under persecution more than any other faith around the world today? In India is one of the worst, as well as North Korea, China, Vietnam, Sudan, Somalia, Iran. The list goes on and on. In Pakistan, a 16-year-old boy is sentenced to death on trumped-up charges because saying that he blasphemed the prophet Muhammad, 16 years old. We even see persecution here in the West. Just this past week, I I read and saw a video of this uh, street preacher. He wore a T-shirt that said, Jesus saves. That's all. He was in the Mall of America. And in the Mall of America, as he was walking around, on the back it said, Jesus is the only way. The mall police came up to him and demanded him to take that T-shirt off or leave the mall because it was offensive to people. After defending himself, the mall police supervisor came up, sent, came up to him and said, you're good, it's okay, you can walk through the mall. He wasn't preaching, he wasn't talking, he was just walking. There are numerous cases, even throughout the United States, where Christians are having to defend their rights as followers of Jesus Christ. Persecution. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward. See, you're looking to a future fulfillment. A promise that God has for us when we see him face to face. For so they persecute the prophets who before you. He's saying, you're in good company. Don't worry. You'll get your reward when you see me face to face. All the Beatitudes, the end with the promise. There's a present fulfillment of joy and blessing. There's immediate fulfillment and a future realization, fulfillment of, of joy and blessings and seeing Jesus face to face and walking obedience to him. You know, God's idea of happiness in his economy is not what this world teaches. This happiness is not subject to our circumstances in life. It's not subject to the world economy or even personal dreams and expectations, if you can believe that. This joy, this happiness is not dependent on whether somebody likes me or not or, or accepts me for who I am or not. God's happiness is rooted in knowing his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, and knowing my identity 
is in him and only in him. And that God loves me, that I'm accepted in Jesus Christ, and that God's word is full of all kind of promises that the Father has promised me. And God doesn't lie and go back on his promises like people do. He always keeps his promises. And God will fulfill his promises in due time. Jesus said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It's a call to discipleship, of denying ourselves every day and following Christ Jesus. Our culture says, you deserve it. Live life to the fullest. Live out your dreams. There's nothing wrong with that. But a life that lives independently of Jesus Christ is a lost life. Because there's a life that is to come that one day all this will be like a dream. The Bible says what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. Keep your eyes on the eternal promises of God. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the finish line as you run this race of faith. As you see Jesus, our Savior, our coach of life, say, come on, come on, follow me. Come on, you can make it. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on me. Go forward. Don't worry about what this world says. Don't worry about what people say about you. Follow me. Receive me. Live in me. Believe in me. And you'll be happy. And you'll have joy inexpressible, full of glory that nobody, no one, that this world cannot take away. Amen and amen. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for the joy and happiness that we have in Jesus Christ. That the joy that we have in you, O oh God, that nobody can take away and that the joy and happiness of your economy is not based on the economy of this world but a right, right relationship with you, Father God, in Jesus Christ. Thank you for making that a reality. Thank you for making it a possibility by faith in you. So bless us all now, Father, I pray, as we go about this day, walking obedience to you, Jesus, taking up our cross, denying ourselves, and following in you. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you take your hymn book and let's uh, stand and join together and sing in our closing hymn on page 533. Now thank we all our God.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. His face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. May the Lord keep you this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.